And so at the start, um, before the interview, we'd like to show our respect to Kelly and John um, for accepting the invitation and then we could have the chance to have communications with you. And we really hope the interview could uh, present some professional perspectives for scholars interested in real-time prognosis and health management of uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. And so, as you know, uh, we invited Dr. Sierra Koskun to uh, provide the interview questions. And many thanks to Dr. Sierra Koskun here. And so, and um, we'll invite John to answer us questions. Hi, John. Um, could you share with us um, how correlated is the sizing of a battery in UAV performance? Um, it's it's a very important matter to correctly size the battery. And I think there's mainly two reasons. The probably the most obvious one, the one we always the first one we all think about is more weight in an aircraft, uh the performance is gonna be worse, right? Uh you need that trade-off between how many batteries you put in there, how large they are, and what range you want to achieve. So you need to reach that optimum point for whatever your application is of, okay, this is my range. This is how much capacity I need. So you need to really balance that trade-off. Um, and I would say that another very important reason is we are used to uh, jet engines that consume um, gas. Um, and so we're used to planes where the take of weight is not equal to the landing weight and the landing weight is lower because we burn fuel when we're flying. Um, so the requirements for landing are, the, the weight of the aircraft is, is lower when, when it's landing. Uh, so that means you can dimension your landing gear for a lower weight. You can have a lower approach speed and so on, which doesn't happen with an electric aircraft. So it's really important for me, those are the two main reasons why it's really important to correctly size the battery. Okay, thank you. Uh, it gives a clear explanation about the correlation between the battery size and UV performance that can be easy to understand by audience. Okay, let's move on to the next question. And from the real-time implementation viewpoints, which methods, uh, including sport vector machine, SVM and RVM and FIS, presents good potential as a battery management methods in UAV? Um, so first thing I want to say, I we are not that far in the research yet. It's one of the next steps that we want to apply. We're not that far yet, but I'll share my thoughts of what I think it's uh, the best method anyway. Um, so I think there's two things to consider here. One is the memory, the storage capacity for the model. Uh, these are complex models. Um, so, you know, there, there needs to be enough memory to store all these data and the, the data and the algorithm on board. That's the first thing to consider. And uh, the second one is the computational power. If the model is too complex, uh, this, especially the research we have conducted was all with uh, multi-copters. So they typically have onboard, um, single board computers, which have just enough power to execute this method, these methodologies. So the computational power is the second important thing. Uh, taking into account these two things, I would say that both RVM and the FASI inference system are the best methodologies. They you can reduce the model to a few data points and the execution is fast in both. Uh, from those two, if we need to put it in an aircraft, I would probably pick the FASI system just because certification is gonna be one of the next steps to do. And the explainability of the FASI system is gonna make it easier. Okay, thanks for detailed answers, providing a good direction for those who do research in this field and then practicing, practicing to the real researchers. And then it is stated that the NASA Ames battery line dataset is obtaining a controlled area. 
what type of uh, modifications are needed in SVM, RVM, and FIS methods for um, accurate estimation using the data set directly obtained from a UAV test? Well, again, I have to say the comparison between lab testing and field testing is going to be part of the end of my thesis, which I'm currently conducting. Um, but again, I, I can give you some ideas. Um, so both RVM, the three met methodologies deal with the uncertain, with the additional uncertainty that the field testing provides. We have things that we cannot control as opposed to a lab. Um, the problem with these two, with RVM and SVM, is that there is the parameter, the uh, margin width that we need to estimate. And we cannot estimate an, until we have some data and we look at the results. Then we can estimate that parameter. And it's it's pretty important to have a good value for that. Otherwise, we're going to either um, overfit. Sorry, I couldn't get the term. Uh, if we don't get that parameter right, we're going to overfit, especially the SVM methodology. RVM being probabilistic, it's a bit. Uh, it, it doesn't require such a good estimation, but SVM especially needs a very good estimation of that parameter. Uh, the FASI system, the FIS, does not need a parameter. Um, FASI systems naturally embrace the uncertainties. So I, I would say that <clears throat> um, the FASI system is the best one for that, for that reason, when, when we're dealing with uncertainty from, from field testing. And I don't think it requires more modifications because it already embraces that uh, uncertainty. Okay, thanks for answering. As scholars have seen questions, may get information from your answer as well as your articles. And then um, can the pro uh, proposed data-driven approach be also utilized for accurate and robust surface temperature estimation of a battery, which is an important de um, degeneration factor for batteries? Um, the short answer is yes. The methodologies allow for multidimensional data input. <clears throat> so the short answer is yes, we can include that. The problem, of course, is as we add more variables into the model, we need one more data uh, to get the good model. Um, it's the curse of dimensionality. We are all familiar with it. And um, also we'll need a longer com uh, longer times to get the model like computationally and so on. Um, I guess that it depends how accurate you wanna estimate the temperature. I think that you can do simple models but accurate enough uh, following physical modeling as opposed to data-driven modeling for a temperature. The battery has very complex dynamics inside, but I think that the temperature, if we want a simplistic model, it's easy enough to get just a physical model um, instead of the data-driven model. Now, I think it's it, it would be interesting to study that trade-off, how, how accurate do we want it and how much computational power are we adding to the equation uh, if we want to get this. Okay, thank you. That makes clear to readers about data-driven approach application. Mm -hmm. And um, due to the complicated uh, electrochemical dynamics, better aging is an important phenomenon to properly model and estimate the state of the health, uh, especially in ground vehicles. So how can this phenomenon be addressed in UAV applications? Um, so as the question said, it is a complicated problem. The dynamics are very complicated. Um, and I think that right now there's there's two ways to, to deal with it. One is go for a very complicated physical model, which requires a lot of knowledge about the internal chemistry of the battery, about the reactions happening in there. And they are very heavy models, which I don't think that can be run in a single board computer, as we're doing right now with small quadcopters, multicopters, and so on. Uh, the other option is a lot of testing. Uh, if you want to study the dynamics of a complex 
uh, system. You need a lot of testing to do it, and that's the other way we we have. They are they have they both have their pros and cons, but um, I would say those two are the main approaches. Okay, thanks for answering. The phenomenon of better aging really attracted attention in scholars in related fields, and re the solutions in UAV applications can provide a way to scholars for a response. And uh, can the proposed techniques be extended to um, estimate other internal states such as state of energy, state of power, state of temperature for effective charge management of batteries? The short answer is yes. Uh, in a previous publication to this one, we showed how to apply RBM to the state of health problem, which is very closely related to the state of energy problem. Um, so yes, and, and then generally speaking, these methodologies are all suitable. We, we've shown it in this paper, all these methodologies are suitable uh, to model strongly nonlinear variables and problems. Both the state of temperature and the state of power are gonna be nonlinear, uh, regressions. So we have not tested, we have not applied the methodologies to them, but my prediction is that they should work because it's more or less the same kind of nonlinear variable. Okay, thanks for all your answers. Um, making a great explanation and a supplementation to your article and questions of concerns to scholars. And it's very practical and enlightening. And then we'll invite Kelly to share on his broader perspectives about um, the impact of AI machine learning on real-time prognosis and health management of aut autonomous vehicles ground or air. So Kelly, uh, could you share with us about it? Yes, um, so we are in this industry 4.0 period where there's a lot of data and a lot of technologies that can allow us to see an increase in autonomous intelligence systems, both ground and then also with the advanced air mobility, which is a has an economic global impact of $1.9 trillion. You can see that the world of aerospace is changing with many new players coming in. For this vision to be realized, you need to be able to guarantee safety. You need to be able to guarantee performance. And this assurance is only possible when you include the techniques of um, what happens when there are malfunctions, what are you fault tolerant? And in order to be able to control and guarantee safety when things are not nominal when things have been degraded, we need to be able to have a very good prognostic. So given the rise of machine learning and the opportunities that we see, the capabilities of um, a lot of the AI techniques to be able to deliver accurate predictions, we would be able to realize this field and we think in the next decade or two, we would be able to get there. Now, not all AI systems and algorithms are the same. There are those that are more trustworthy than others. There are those that are more brittle than others. So we've got to be careful to ensure because when we release these autonomous systems into the public, they have to perform and the public needs to trust them. Right. So if I'm going to have my children, my family be on an autonomous car or an autonomous air taxi, I've got to make sure that, hey, I'm not putting them in harm's way. For that to happen, I have to trust the system. To be able to trust the system, I need to have a set of very trustworthy autonomous systems that will make that happen. And the techniques that we are building, the ability to monitor the health of a vehicle would be crucial and critical when it comes to guaranteeing that safety. Okay, thanks for your broader perspectives in this topic. 
and hold the answers respectfully from broader and uh, specific perspectives can convey audiences some advanced information in this field. And the interview record will upload in our YouTube channel and also in our official website. So we could, uh, we will let you know once the video is up uploaded. And that's all for this interview. And thanks again for doing this interview and for the interview questions Dr. Theodore Coskin provide us with. And happy to cooperate with you this time. It's a special experience for us. Thank you very Thank much. You. And then please let me know on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, because I like to share it. I always enjoy um, having to, I take a lot of pride in my students. John Ander is one of the finest. Um, he has done some exceptional work and I'm looking forward to him uh, finishing off his thesis and then coming up with uh, a few more publications in this area. So this would give him an added boost, having to showcase his work even better uh, on social media. And uh, I thank uh, Complex Engineering Systems uh, and uh, Professor Hamid Karimi for giving us this opportunity and for encouraging you to interview us. Thank you very much.